After failing dismally in my first career dream of being a professional triathlete, I studied medicine on an army scholarship. I passed the Punishing Special Air Service Regiment SASR, a selection course, then served on over 100 combat missions in Afghanistan as a frontline special operations doctor. My casualties included fellow SAS soldiers, commandos, local civilians, and even the enemy. The thrill of adventure and the challenges of battlefield medicine gave me a sense of purpose in testing my skills to the limits. But the despair of being helpless to save my friends in their final moments haunted me. My journey back to a fulfilling life began when I moved into medical leadership roles. The medical skills honed in Afghanistan started saving civilian lives. In 2021, I co-authored a best-selling book on resilience, and appeared as the lead medic, Dr. Dan, on the hit TV show SAS Australia. In 2022, I released my memoir, The Combat Doctor. Outside work, you can often find me driving my vintage Lamborghini in the Adelaide Hills, or standing next to it awaiting another tow truck. I'm married to an incredibly tolerant wife and have three sons. I'm just a small average guy who pushed himself to perform in complex environments. Now I can give you the tools to thrive. Dr. Dan Pronk Ex-Special Ops Doctor Author Speaker TV Personality I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. No, thanks for reaching out. It's, um, it's incredible how much I think moral injury is misunderstood, not acknowledged, lumped in with, with PTSD, other forms of trauma and, mm -hmm. and, or, or just completely missed because it hasn't been a, a, people don't think it's a significant enough event to create a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke with somebody last night who um, he was in the infantry, um, with the Marines and the, and the American Marines. And not only was he, what was his group hit by an IED, but his best friend was his buddy standing in front of him and his buddy died. And so he was talking about how he still, res he has the traumatic brain injury. He has the PTSD, but then he also has the survivor's guilt with that moral yeah. injury of why did my best friend die and not me? Why, me, why did yeah. I get to live? So that is, yeah, it, you're right. It is misunderstood. And I've had to deal with that same survivor's guilt. So it's, it just, it doesn't go away when you question why am I still living and this other person is not. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's hopelessly tough, isn't it? And there's no. It's a question that you, you just can't answer. You're never going to get an answer. So you you sort of spin on loop uh, as mm -hmm. with a lot of this moral injury type stuff. There's there's nothing that can be fixed there, right. and you ruminating just doesn't get you anywhere. So yeah. Anyway, it's yeah. <laughs> it is. It's a it's a it's a big it's a big puzzle that. You, a mystery that you're never going to solve no matter how yes. smart we are or anything else I'm, i mean i'm not the doctor you are so <laughs> no but i mean yeah even still it's it's um exactly as you you say it's not i mean it's something that i think you need to make peace with or find peace with if you can because otherwise and and i've i've got mates who are doing it you know i spent years on that ruminative loop running the what ifs through my mind why did why did this happen why did that happen what if i had done this and but yet, there is no there's no way forward there it's not something you can solve and so that you got to try and find some way to let it go or make peace with it but then it, i don't think it's in the nature of most military members or emergency responders to to do that it feels like you've conceded defeat or something along those lines mm -hmm. I agree. And, and you're right, too. That's the, that's the thing, too, is that 
those medical first responders, firefighters, um, police, <laughs> they they deal with that too on a daily basis, I imagine. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, exactly right. So what I I think when I read your LinkedIn post, I only got a, the a glimpse of what happens. So for you, what is it that happened? Were you given a directive of no medical care while in the air, or how did that? How did that? No, out? no, no. It. Um, so what happened was we were. So I was deployed with uh, Australian Space Operations Task Group, and we had a relationship with the the dust off crew out of the base we were based out of in Tarancot. And so we would put one of our members on their aircraft for 24 hours at a time and do shifts with the, the dust off bird. And so I was doing one of these shifts and we got the call that, that this bloke had been shot and, and they'd, they'd taken him to a nearby uh, USSF base. And so he was on a, a, a compound, a safe compound. And the, the medics there, the 18 Delta had started treating this guy. And so we launched with the, the dust off bird. So it was a medical evacuation helicopter. So we were absolutely able to, to do medical interventions, but the procedure I ended up doing was not authorized. So the, mm -hmm. the procedure which involved uh, making a hole in this guy's chest was not in their protocols. And so while it was something that as a doctor, I was qualified to do and, and did, you know, semi-routinely in places like Afghanistan, I was meant to work subordinate to the flight medic and abide by the protocols of the helicopter. And so that was what caused problems from the the um, dust off side of things. And then the, the other part of it was the fact that I'd used this knife that, that uh, was not a medical instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... You know, and I was I was just sharing with a, a Navy, he was a Navy corpsman, he was a Navy medic, and I was just sharing with him, yeah, you know, like just the gist of what uh, your post was that I read, and he was like, "Man, I want to hear this guy's story because because medic uh, because med the medical field is an interest of him. It's what he did yeah. while he was in the military. So yeah, he was he was quite interested as well." No, oh, for sure. Look, I mean, and there's, there's, there's certainly, I, I think, a, a real interest and some interesting stuff, and and certainly some of the, the colleagues of mine and and uh, have got some amazing stories collectively of these similar sort of things, these improvised uh, treatments and these amazing, you know, saves against all odds, and yeah, it's um, I, I find it fascinating as well, and it's always yeah. great when someone shares one of them. Mm -hmm. I agree. It, it is. So, and so am I remembering correctly, you got, you also got investigated because of that, of what you did. Yeah. So the, the, there was a couple of investigations that were, were launched. One was into the, why I had done that procedure on the helicopter when it's, it was above their protocols at that stage. Mm -hmm. And the second was uh, why I had used a, a you know, a, a, a boot knife basically to do a mm -hmm. surgical procedure. Uh, and it, obviously the, from that perspective, the, the correct thing to use was a, a sterile surgical instrument, a scalpel. I just didn't have one on me. Mm -hmm. So did everything from that turn out okay? Yeah, it did in the end. I think there was a lot, and uh, thankfully, the the both those investigations came from external to uh, my task group, and I had the support of my task group. So, I mean, that was a massive thing. I think when we look at moral injury, uh, a lot of it can be a perception of betrayal from the chain of command. People's mm -hmm. superiors have kind of uh, thrown them in front of the bus, if you like, to mm -hmm. often to you know, not, not save themselves, but to, to have a scapegoat for, for an event or that's the perception anyway. Mm -hmm. And that certainly was not the case here. So that made a, a huge difference I bet. to have that support of my chain of command. But um, yeah, so so one, one lot of investigations came from that 
medical evacuation hierarchy that, that mm -hmm. was running the dust off bird. And the other came from the surgical team who we uh, who we handed the casualty over to and completed his treatment on that night. But yeah, they both ended up well. So I think the after we, uh, I ended up in, in a really, there was a, a lot of emotion initially and in this, I think there was a, a perception that I had used this knife as a, an instrument of choice. I, don't, I think it was lost in the initial uh, kind of interpretation that I just didn't have any other knife that I honestly believed this guy was gonna gonna die before we got to the surgical facility. And so it was an absolute last resort, but I think initially it was perceived that I'd, I'd just done this because I wanted to use my, my boot knife to open the bloke's chest. And and so once it that became clear, uh, people sort of a bit of the emotion came out of it and, mm -hmm. and the, the um, my, my actions were eventually concluded to be appropriate under the circumstances, and I ended up having some the opportunity to meet with the the uh, flight surgeon who was overarching the dust off capability there, and and we eventually sort of massaged the protocols to to be a bit more uh, inclusive, and so. Yeah, everything ended up well in the end, and and mm -hmm. what what had started off to be quite a uh, emotional and sort of finger pointing exercise, thankfully turned into rational and civil discussion around what had happened yes. and had some good outcomes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the emotions you were going through. Um, now, I don't know if this is across the board with medical with with the medical field, but I I know in the U.S the medical um, like mantra is to first do no harm. Is that a similar stance in Australia as well? That as yeah, a doctor, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It, and so I would imagine then that that's what played a big part in here's, here's the mindset of being a medical provider. And then here's the mindset of this dust off command of what to do and they seem to contradict each other. So were you battling with that of what yeah, look, is the right I, thing to do? Oh, for sure. Look, it, it, um, and I guess this comes down to, you can do, and, and absolutely, I mean, we abide by those exact same principles that um, Hippocratic Oath and that, that do no harm type uh, philosophy. But in, in light of that, when, once we start talking about doing surgical procedures to open up someone's chest you can do a lot of harm in the wrong context in that setting so it's mm -hmm. it's i think these all the the protocols that were in place existed with the best of intent so and certainly there was there was scope for the the flight medics on that that helicopter to be able to relieve pressure in people's chests in this setting which was happening on that instance that the guy had been shot a couple of times. Air had gotten into his chest. It was leaking out of his his punctured lung, and and it was expanding in his chest. So that was what was causing the issue—a thing called a tension pneumothorax. And there there are procedures to put needles in people's chests to relieve that pressure, mm -hmm. and we'd done that. So I mean, there were certainly protocols there to enable these flight medics to to relieve that situation. The problem with this setting was the guy was also bleeding significantly into that chest so he had trapped blood and air that was expanding and it was just pressurizing half of his chest and causing his heart to to fail as a pump and and so he needed a bigger hole in his chest so there were certainly protocols to deal with this they just didn't extend to cutting a hole in someone's chest and that was what i felt was required at the time mm -hmm. So with that, and I guess this is where like the crux of the moral injury is, is that was it an instant, hey, look, I have to do this so that this guy can survive. I'm doing it in the story. Or was there a lot more thought of, I wonder if I should try this or not? Yeah, I mean, there was a bit of a period of hesitation. What had happened was we we had done the initial needle intervention. We both recognised, and when I say uh, we both, there was a, a US dust off flight medic on the helicopter as well. And 
we both recognised this guy had this tension pneumothorax and, and I'd initially placed a needle into his chest. It worked a little bit, relieved a bit of his the pressure in his chest. Then as we continued to fly, he worsened again. The flight medic put a second needle in a, a different spot in his chest and that one didn't do anything. And so it was at, at that point, we we're about five minutes out from base, from the surgical facility. And the guy was deteriorating. We couldn't get a blood pressure. He was unconscious. Uh, and I, I assessed that he was, you know, he was dying and, and didn't have five minutes. I did have a brief discussion over the, the um, bird's internal comms with the flight medic saying, hey, look, you know, have you got a scalpel? I want to, I want to uh, open up this guy's chest. And, and, and the flight medic said, no, I don't have one. Um, actually, at that point, the pilot hopped up on the internal comms and, and said, what's going on back there? <laughs> like, but um, he, he, he got ignored at the time. And, yes, and, I bet. Uh, yeah. And so we, we, there was that initial period of frustration. I, I had packed a, a kit in my, uh, in my medical kit, a small vacuum sealed pack with what I thought was the, the equipment to do this very procedure. But I had just failed to put a scalpel in that. So I had thought of this and, and thought I'd prepared for it and I'd, I'd failed to pack my kit properly was the reason why I didn't have the appropriate instrument. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, this brief, maybe 15, 20 seconds of just this absolute frustration that I didn't have anything to, to do this procedure that I thought was required to save this guy's life. And and then it occurred to me that I had the the boot knife, so my, like a little fighting knife on my um, on my plate carrier on my my body armor, and I, I drew the thing. And I I, I remember I, I sort of showed it to the flight medic. I didn't say anything over the communications, but but we're on either sides. We're kneeling in the back of the helicopter, uh, Black Hawk, and and the casualties lying between us. And I just held this thing up to to show the the flight medic and. And and he drew his hand across his neck. <laughs> he's, he's like, no, 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 do, do not do that. Cease and, fire. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just that. It, no words were required. It was that universal body language for no, mm -hmm. that's a bad idea. Uh, and and at that point, I I, I reevaluated the casualty really briefly. He had no signs of life. We were a few minutes out from base uh, still, and that was when I just went ahead and and uh, did that that surgical procedure so now and how long ago was this that it happened uh, 12 years so that was back oh, in 2011 okay. yeah wow yeah so now that you that much time has passed by is there a sense of I'm glad I did what I did no matter the consequences because now this guy is living Whereas had I not done this, it wasn't looking hopeful at all. Oh, for sure. And look, I mean, there's a, there's a second part to that story as well. And that's the, the fact that uh, as, as we were spinning up, we got the, we got the, um, the call to go and, and retrieve this bloke. And, and so we'd run out to our helicopter, we'd spun the helicopter up and, and, we were waiting for our, our chase bird. We needed an escort helicopter to come with the dust off bird to provide a bit of security and armed escort. And and the the Black Hawk that was our escort had a malfunction. And so it didn't fire up. And so we were ready to go and we didn't have a chase bird. And so the, the and, and we were getting information from the field that this casualty was deteriorating, that his blood pressure was critically low. And and the the pilot of uh, of our Black Hawk, the dust off bird, uh, he hopped up on, on the internal comms and basically had a discussion with myself and the flight medic saying, hey, you know, the, has this guy got long to live? And, and the word had come through that they were trying to spin up an Apache, but it was going to be 15 minutes away. And so we were stuck there potentially for 15 minutes. And and we, we basically said, look, nah, probably not. You know, if we're delayed by 15 minutes, it's it's every chance this guy's going to gonna die. And and so that pilot launched without authorization. And so he made that decision, which is a massive decision mm -hmm. to to take an aircraft out outside the wire in the war zone um, without without a chase burden, without authorization. And so, I mean, in, in the discussion of moral injury, he was a bloke who had this decision to risk his career against mm -hmm. the the potentially saving the life of a stranger. And so he chose to launch. We grabbed this guy 
And then on the way back, it sort of in the back of the bird, we had our own uh, kind of uh, moral choice to make as well. So it was mm-hmm. a, a good case case study in these damned if you do, damned if you don't type yeah. uh, si- situations. Yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, that's amazing <clears throat> how I think for both you, the flight medic and the pilot to make those decisions because even though it might be against protocol, it's what w- was best for that particular situation. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. I, I say kudos to you guys. Good good on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. And I mean, to return to your question of earlier, the um, I'm, I'm certainly glad that I act in, acted in that way. And I'd, I'd always hoped that um, my, my ethics and values were always based around doing what I felt was right, even if that bent the rules. And I, I found myself in a number of situations, actually, in uh, over my deployments to Afghanistan, where that was required, that, that was and there was a couple of times where I'd actually discussed things with my chain of command before I deployed about certain capabilities that we had that we didn't have approval for or protocols for. And, and I remember at one point saying to my big boss back in Australia, uh, just saying, hey, look, I, I've got this capability. If I need it, I'm, I'm going to use it. Where do I stand in terms of, uh, you know, the punishment of that? And, and basically being told, well, you know, as a person, I, I support that. I can see that that's the right thing. But uh, in my professional role, we're going to have to punish you for that. There'll be disciplinary, potentially disciplinary action. So, I mean, it was this really tough, even from that that chain of commands perspective, mm-hmm. they were personally supportive, but in their professional capacity, they were obliged to, uh, you know, hold fast with those rules. And I get that. I mean, if, if you start to bend those rules or not investigate people who are deviating from protocol and procedure, then things get loose pretty quickly. So it's yeah. it's a fine balance, a really fine yeah. balance. And imagine if those if the, if if rules were bent all the time and there was no accountability, then what's the yeah. point in having those rules in place? Because people are going to do what yeah. they want to do anyway. So yeah, yeah. But I think when you use that good sound judgment of saying, hey, there's a legitimate reason why I am breaking protocol because this person's life is hanging in the balance. So my actions or inactions will either save the life or not. So I think that's a lot to process within that short amount, a short amount of time. And yeah, and and to be honest, I don't think that any of that really crossed my mind in terms of the potential consequences and Mm -hmm. I I didn't I I wasn't even aware until afterwards that I had gone above the the protocols and so I mean we'd we'd um sorted this guy out in flight I'd I'd opened up his chest and a whole bunch of pressurized air and blood came spurting out and and then actually he, he he subsequently just as we landed he had a cardiac arrest so his heart stopped beating and we did a, a brief period of CPR, myself and the, the flight medic, as we drove from the, the airstrip, the landing zone to the hospital and managed to get a heartbeat uh, within about a minute of, of CPR, got him into the, the, the um, resuscitation bay and they had a stack of blood ready for transfusion. And, and so they and then they got him into theatre and they, they opened up his chest properly and, and sorted out the, the wounds. But I just remember... In that moment, it was a pretty, uh, for me, you know, adrenaline fueled sort of a moment, and and it was a pretty. I was I was pretty euphoric, to be honest. I was I was kind of high as a kite. It was, uh, and I was stoked that the the guy was still alive. And and I remember we were walking back from the the resus bay, so we'd handed over this guy. They'd done the initial resuscitation, and we're getting him into surgery. I was covered in blood from from this bloke, and and sort of buzzing on adrenaline and. And I just remember walking back down to the flight line and the medic was really quiet. And, and I sort of said to him, you all right, man? And he's like, oh, I reckon, I reckon there's going to be trouble here. <laughs> and that was the first inkling. I said, well, how do you mean? He goes, well, we're, we're not really allowed to do that on the bird. 
And I'm like, oh, okay. And that was the first <laughs> inkling that that there was a, a little bit of a, a storm what did I brewing. Do here? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I'm kind of like, oh, right, okay. And and so it was, um, yeah, that that was the first indication that that I might have overstepped the boundary. But up until that point, it had never occurred to me that I was yeah. I was going above and beyond. I, I knew obviously that the use of the knife was going to draw interest, but I hadn't realised that second. Uh, sort of investigation was coming yeah. down range. <laughs> yeah. So do you do you ever keep in touch with that flight medic and pilot or no? Not the medic. No, I lost touch with uh, with him. The the pilots I did briefly, and um, yeah, I, I actually just through that LinkedIn uh, post recently, I've, I've okay. got in touch with one of the the um head flight medics that ran dust off over there who's in touch with the pilot so hopefully i'll reconnect there but um yeah. no we, we've all sort of you know it's, it's been it's been over a decade and i guess yeah. people drift off and, and go go their separate ways yeah that's one of the things that i've noticed i was in the military for 24 years and yeah. some some relationships you stay in touch and then they but most of them they just die off no yeah. no hard feelings it's just you go your own separate ways and I think that's healthy I, I really do I mean it's and everyone negotiates transition differently mm -hmm. uh, but I I certainly think that if if you're one who just maintains those really strong ties and still identifies as military and still moves in those circles with your, your old military friends, it's very hard to rebuild a new identity and move forward mm -hmm. as a civilian in a productive fashion. And, and I, I, I tend to look at it like a, a, a significant relationship, like a marriage that's, that's maybe broken up. If you're constantly phoning your ex and hanging out with your ex and thinking about your ex, then it's very hard to, to establish a new meaningful relationship and, and move forward. And, and so I think there's some parallels there with mm -hmm. transitioning from, from the military, but yeah, it, it is interesting to, to watch people. Some manage that really well and keep a strong military group of friends, but, but build a, a new identity. Uh, I found that, that, it was healthy for me to to let a lot of those relationships uh, drop away, and and then later on, when I'd reestablished myself as a civilian, reconnect. But when you you have a new identity, reconnect with that person, and so yeah, it, everyone mm -hmm. does it differently. Yeah, were you able to connect with that patient at all? No. no. So that that was one of the um, the I guess the downsides of working in the forward surgical teams and mm -hmm. places like. TK is that we would do that that uh, medical evacuation if, if we were on the dust off birds or if we were out in the field and, and we brought casualties back they'd get stabilized they'd get their initial wound surgery at, at one of the FSTs but then you'd pretty quickly backload them to a, a higher level of medical care and and so with that particular patient so we'd uh, we'd launched just on on dusk, and so we got him just as it was going dark. Did our thing, dragged him back. Uh, he got resuscitated, had his surgery, and then was in a um, induced coma after that in in intensive care. And then I was still on shift the next morning, and we transferred him down to Kandahar. So that was the last I saw of him. So yeah, didn't I, I did loosely track him for while he was at Kandahar enough to know that he he'd made it and um, had woken up from his they'd woken him up from his from his coma and so but yeah after that lost track how, how does that how does that make you feel that next morning when you and, and and your bit of tracking of him how does that make you feel like this person has a full life ahead of him because I did I fulfilled my role as a doctor oh I mean, yeah look i mean i i, I think the it, it certainly there was dozens of people who had a hand in in that guy's survival it, it wasn't it's not like i just did this intervention and miraculously he <laughs> he yeah. lived you know and, and 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 to back right up to that pilot who chose to launch uh without the chase bird so i mean if, if that pilot hadn't have made that decision then uh the bloke would have would have died so there was so much 
And if the, the people in the field hadn't have done what they did when the bloke got shot, if the 18 Delta who initially managed him hadn't done what he did. So there was a, there was dozens of people, but uh, to, to answer your question, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, I think a very, um, a very professionally satisfying feeling to know that you've done the appropriate thing at the time to uh, allow someone to, to get to a higher level of medical care, I think. But the, the problem with that is you only ever know after the fact is the, the thing. And, and mm -hmm. so I think probably a more professionally uh, satisfying part of that experience was to find out that I could act in alignment with my ethics and morals in an improvised fashion, in a complex situation. So I think for me, that was the most satisfying part of that experience was mm -hmm. to, to know that, that, that it was a, a bit of a testing situation and I managed to negotiate it and get a good result. And so I guess it was a validation of a lot of the, the training that was invested in me. Uh, but also, I think none of us really know. We like to think that we'll be able to perform under pressure, but you never really know till you're there. And, and so yeah. it, it was professionally rewarding. And the fact that the, the guy survived was just a, a massive bonus. But I mean, that is amazing. And you're right. That was not a one man show. Um, it, no, it, no. it was definitely a team effort and every person had to play their part in order for it to be a success. And so I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, now, it, it was a great demonstration of that, that capability that, that is, you, you know, now universal with four deployed elements of the survivability. I mean, you take that sort of injury back to the, the Vietnam era and the survival rate sort of plummets and, and there was some great capability in Vietnam and but you know I mean we've moved so uh, forward with all of the capability and these it's it, it, it is just amazing and I think it's a real testament to the, the crews like the dust off crews the forward elements like your, your 18 delders and your, your other medical elements and then the the surgical capabilities that these really rudimentary forward surgical teams just doing this amazing uh, you know life preserving surgery. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, earlier about the transition from the military life to the next life of, of whatever that is. What was your transition out of, like from out of the military to you know, being a doc? Are you a doctor still, right? Yeah, yeah. So what was that like for yeah. you? It was rocky. <laughs> it was rough. And yes. I, I think, and it, it was something that, to be truthful, caught me by surprise. I I discharged uh, voluntarily, so I, I wasn't forced out for any reason, physical or psychological or, or what have you. It was a, a choice that I made with my family. So I'd come back from my fourth tour of Afghanistan in uh, maybe three years. I'd, I'd, so I was on pretty high rotation in Afghanistan and, and I had a young family. Uh, third son was born about a week after I got back from my fourth tour. And it was at that point that my wife just said, hey, look, you know, that's it's enough. You, you, you need to stop playing this game. And mm -hmm. and she was right. I, I was I was ready to to um, discharge. And so I, I put all in my papers and, and had six months left uh, in my posting and, and finished that up and then discharged. And I'd only really seen the positive. So, I mean, I, I had this young family that I'd missed the, the first, you know, basically the first three years of my five-year-old's life. And, and so I'd be home more than ever. I'd be safer than ever. I'd be earning more money as a civilian doctor than a, I did in the military. And, and so there was all these positives. But when I got out within about sort of three to six months, I, I really started to struggle. It was the, mm -hmm. the first time that I started to get proper post-traumatic stress symptoms. I was getting the flashbacks, the bad dreams. I was hypervigilant more than ever. I had this, this ridiculous startle reflex and mm -hmm. all this stuff that, that I, as a doc, I looked at it and I'm like, this is, this is post-traumatic stress. And, but I, thought, I just thought it was weird that I was getting it at that point when I was never safer. I was home with my family. I was mm -hmm. earning more money. On paper, things were heaps better, but mm -hmm. psychologically, things were were much worse and and it got me very interested in 
like I'm reflecting and looking back and thinking, what was it that was so protective about being part of the, the military and particularly part of a tight-knit group like uh, Army Special Operations? What, what were those factors that made us so resilient? Mm -hmm. And if I can work that out, how do I rebuild them? And so that sort of got me interested in what eventually became a, a, um, a well, a book that I co-wrote with a couple of other uh, special operations veterans called Resilient Shield, and then a, a model of resilience to, to, it was sort of, for me, it started off as this roadmap to try and rebuild myself as a civilian. And then it ended up in this, uh, this sort of book project and this, this company around resilience. So it's been a great journey, that one. So speaking of which, you did, um, on, on the forum, you did say that resiliency and processing trauma and PTSD is a, a, maybe a bit of, of a passion for you. Why is that? Is it because you had to go through your own journey of processing your own issues like you said, a time after you got out, is that what created that passion for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it started off as, well, it, it was kind of a, a really, <clears throat> as I said, it was a, it struck me as, as being uh, paradoxical, that I, I was struggling at a point where, where I was actually better off in life in a lot of ways. And, and so, I mean, that got me interested in it. And then also, kind of living these symptoms, but observing them almost as a third person, as a doctor, looking at it, thinking, well, why is this happening? And, and for me, the way my mind works, if I could kind of crack that code, it was almost like I could solve the problem. Like if I, I needed to build this roadmap, I was in this, this dark place where all this stuff was happening. I knew there was a way to get back to the other place. And I just needed to, to make the links and, and build the, the roadmap. And, and as I started to do that, I started doing a bit of blogging. And because, uh, you know, we didn't have social media profiles when I was with special operations. And so I'd sort of popped out of the army in 2014 and I had no social media. I, I still had an old Nokia phone. I didn't even have a smartphone. <laughs> and, and so... So, so I was trying to learn this, um, you know, this this world of, of uh, social media had passed me by, and mm. I was trying to learn all that, negotiate that, and and I started doing a little bit of blogging around my uh, thought processes around social psychological theories around, you know, what I was experiencing, and then then mapping it against what the the medical world knew, what the psychological and psychiatric world knew, and trying to sort of write a few blog articles that that might be relatable to other veterans mm. or not even military, you know, police, first responders, we're, we're all in the same boat when it comes to the exposures, the traumas, the vicarious trauma, the moral injury, all of that sort of stuff is, is universal to all those occupations. And it started to resonate a little bit with people and that kind of fueled the passion. And, and then I wrote a, a short, um, self-published book that that gained a bit of traction and then then went on to to do some some formally published book projects so it sort of it started to snowball just based on the realization that you know I wasn't the only one who was trying to negotiate this path there's there's you know, tens of thousands of, of people around the world trying to make sense of similar things mm -hmm. and it, it just seemed that for, for a few people out there it was what I had to say was resonating and that really uh, kind of fueled the whole thing. So where can people get your book? Um, what was it? Resiliency Shield? Yeah, so there's there's uh, there's three three books that I've got out there. There's uh, the original one was is a bit of a tongue in cheek uh, title. It's called Average 70 Kilo Dickhead. And and that's uh, that's the, the the title is explained in the first paragraph, but mm -hmm. but that's uh, that's out there. There's Resilient Shield, which is the one that I co-authored with um, two other Australian SAS veterans, uh, and then the third one is called The Combat Doctor, which is my uh, autobiography of my time leading up to uh, the military, serving with the army, and then transitioning out. And they're all on Amazon, so they're they're all available. Uh, and internationally on uh, ebook and, and audio book. So they're all available on audio. I've, I've got a website, danpronk.com, where I'd, I'd sell the, the, um, the books and I'm happy to post internationally there as well. 
Awesome. So I'm going to put that, I'm going to put those in the show notes for this so people can check them all out. I really uh, appreciate you Thanks, doing man. this. I really do. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, no, I appreciate, you know, the, the opportunity to, to come on your show and, and I appreciate what you're doing. Certainly uh, looking at the, at the amazing people that you've had on your podcast here and the, the, the whole project, I think anything to be furthering this discussion is, is just incredible. So thank you for what you do. Absolutely. And I didn't realize how passionate I was about it until I started doing more episodes. And I just thought, no, people need to hear this, especially with the moral in- injury. Um, moral injury has been mentioned in other episodes, but only one other episode has it been the topic of discussion. Um, and the and the reason being is because, like you mentioned when we started off, people don't know what moral injury is. It's just like people treat it as a symptom of PTSD when it's not. That's not the case. So I think the more people share their stories, the more we can learn about it and see there are two separate things. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I, I fear also a lot of people who struggle with moral injury don't feel that it warrants speaking up. And, and, and I, I fear that it, they might feel it, it is not on the same level as maybe a direct traumatic exposure uh, and so they they kind of think, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to mention it, or or they have that internal conflict that, well, why am I, you know, why am I so bothered by this? Nothing happened to me. I wasn't even there. You know, these sort of things. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, actually a great um, case study in moral injury. I, I had uh, caught up with a, a mate. He was a, an intelligence guy who was attached to a special operations task group, and he was involved in putting together. Uh, targeting packets and and so he'd, he'd piece all the intelligence together deliver it to to the whoever was going to go out and prosecute the target and and he'd done this intelligence picture and this targeting pack for a mission with it where one of our guys got shot and killed and I, I met with him years after the fact because he was going he'd gotten out of the army he was going through med school and and so I met him in in that capacity and had dinner with him and he brought this thing up and he was he was harboring this this burden of did I miss something? Was my intelligence incomplete? Was it wrong? Was it was it me who somehow failed that led to this soldier being killed? And it was a real uh, sort of eye opener for me. I'd never even considered the fact that that one of our intelligence people would would have would be so damaged by that experience. And and it was you know I mean but it's it's all these sort of things that people mm. carry with them but maybe don't feel he may not have felt that he could voice that to many people uh, because he wasn't on the ground. He wasn't the one getting shot at. He wasn't doing it, but, but he was carrying this burden of the loss of one of our soldiers' lives. And, you know, it's interesting you say that because one of the people that came on the podcast early on was um, a fighter pilot. And Mm. I asked her that very question because she, um, her religious beliefs were, uh, are a big part of her life. So the question I asked her was, how did you grapple with that? Did, was it like before you even took on being a fighter pilot, did you understand the fact that you could potentially be taking a life and most likely will be because of the nature of your job? Um, and she said that, she did end up talking to a chaplain and just said, hey, so here's what I have in front of me. And so she was able to, I don't know if justify is the right word, but she was able to be okay with it because her mindset became, I'm not taking a life, I'm defending the life of the people on my team. And if that means that somebody on the other team doesn't make it home that night then she has successfully done her job by protecting her people on the ground yeah it's i mean it's a it's a fascinating discussion in ethics and we as medical elements and certainly as a doctor Mm -hmm. sort of had to kind of wrestle with that same uh 
situation whereby you know for for me i was there to to preserve life that i mean that was that was the sole purpose for me being out in the field with the the elements was to try and get to that person at point of injury as soon as possible keep them alive long enough to get them back to a, a surgical facility but in order to provide that capability you had to be right there close enough with those people which meant you got yourself in the gunfight and and had to use you know lethal force and and so it's sort of this ultimate paradox you've got a, a doctor with a with an m4 out on special operations mm -hmm. occasionally occasionally needing to to put rounds down range and so it's it's uh, i i sort of justified it well i, I never to be honest, I never had that ethical dilemma. I saw it a lot like you, the fighter pilot you described. This to to be effective in my role and to be as close to the point of injury as possible to try and save the life of one of my teammates. That meant occasionally I had to get in the fight, and that that was perfectly um, justifiable to me. To be honest, and but mm -hmm. I think you, you know if if you think of it uh, too deeply, you you start to to get those real. Um, that real cognitive dissonance, that that difficulty mm -hmm. reconciling why, and certainly I had that externally. Uh, I've had it a lot of times over the years. People not quite getting their head around why a, a, a doctor is is out and about uh, in this context and and potentially mm -hmm. need, needing to get in the fight. And you know that I think that piece is something where a lot of the moral injury happens for those for those individuals who their primary job is kill or be killed um i think that that's a big moral injury issue that they're having to deal with is that yes they did their job they did it effectively um they did it correctly but somebody is somebody is going home in a body bag now because i did my job and even though you you're you know you can stand tall knowing that you did your job that's still another life. And so that ends up being that something that I think a lot of people wrestle with. And like you mentioned, don't, they don't talk about it because, oh, that's just my feelings or that's just, you know, my belief system. So it's not worth talking about when it really is. Yeah, agreed. And, and I think in a lot of ways, it, it's very easy in that context to use lethal force when when things are happening it's a dynamic situation and i mean the ultimate justification is that kill or be killed type scenario where you, you're being shot at and so shooting back makes perfect sense mm -hmm. but uh you know and taking a, a step back from there and dave grossman in his book on killing or on combat i can't remember which one they're both great books i think it's on killing talks about those different distances in in killing and talking about that heat of the moment kill or be killed and then stepping back to these more calculated sort of uh, like sniper engagements where they're not necessarily under direct fire and that being a different psychological uh, sort of experience and and then you know drone strikes and and whatever else the fighter pilot you know uh, hitting a target with some uh, air support or th these sort of things but but I think in in those heat of the in the heat of the moment and and when you're in that environment it's it's probably for most people quite easy to to do those things but it's it's the afterwards you know the the years afterwards like you say when when you might be reflecting on this and the the human uh, sort of aspect of the mm -hmm. what what's happened and and what you might have done and and yeah that's a i mean that's a we're not wired as human beings to take life. It's just not natural to us. And uh, yeah, that, for a lot of people, that's a really hard thing to reconcile and understandably so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for doing this. Um, before we close it out, is there anything that you would want to share with the listening audience? Oh, look, I mean, the there's a lot of things we could go on for another hour that's a that's a pretty open question there yeah <laughs> well i mean but, but, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that one because i do love this topic i mean i feel like we could be on here for hours talking about moral injury all the different situations that could come up that which one do i decide or which way do i go in this particular circumstance 
well, then what if this or what if that? There's so many what ifs that you could, yeah. you know, pull out in that. So, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's quite the topic. I, I, I guess to answer your question, I just I, for, for a start, thanking everyone for, for listening, thanking you again for having me on the show, but also just encouraging people. I know it's almost cliched. It's sort of been done to death, but encouraging people to reach out and, and seek help encouraging people to not diminish or trivialize the, these moral injuries that they might be carrying uh, don't it's not about comparing their experience to someone else's that doesn't work you know it's not it, it, trauma isn't a contest it's not a competition it's not like oh gee I won't talk about my situation because that guy lost a leg or that guy got shot or that guy got blown up or that girl had this happen you know it is it's not a contest if if it's real to you and it's causing problems to you, it's 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 real and it and it should be addressed. And but yeah, I think any conversation, particularly to shine more of a light on the the, the moral injury side of things and to to build that profile of it being something real. It's not uh, as you say, it's not necessarily a symptom of PTSD, although it can coexist. It can it can exist in isolation and and deserves the same attention and treatment and management to process as things like post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. Well, I guess I have to tell you, have a good Friday, because isn't it Friday for you? It is. Yep, you're spot on. Yep, we're just we're just starting our day, actually. Yes. So it's 8.30 in the morning here. So Yes, yeah. and, and where I am, it's 5.30, almost 6 in the evening on Thursday night. So. Gotcha. Well, you, you have a so good Thursday how's the weather? Evening. How's the weather? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> always good in Australia. Always good. Yeah. Oh, see, now I got to come visit. <laughs> well, look me up if you do. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a good rest of the day. I, I appreciate your time. And when I do publish it, I will send you the link to it. So you'll have that. Brilliant. Much appreciated, Tiffany. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Okay.